All right, we are going to get going here. Thank you everybody for coming to today's talk, Lillian J. Rice, A Studied Transformation. I'm gonna be moderating today's um, discussion and we are gonna be talking to Lisa Creedman and Michelle Salt-Smith about Lillian J. Rice, the architect, her history, her legacy, and specifically a home that um, Lisa and Michelle are both working on they're nearing the home stretch of finishing this amazing transformation of a Lillian J. Rice home here in San Diego. They're gonna talk about the entire process, the challenges, the joys, the whole process of updating a beautiful home by Lillian J. Rice. As a quick backgrounder, um, Lisa is um, the principal architect of Island Architects, which is a San Diego based firm. She's known, the firm is known for their enduring approach to both modern and classical um, interiors and architecture. This is Lisa's third Lillian J. Rice home that she's worked on, is that right? Yeah. All right, and um, Island Architect and Lisa work throughout the United States, primarily here in, in San Diego, but throughout the um, United States and beyond on ground up construction and renovation. Uh, Michelle Salt-Smith is the founder of Studio Surface, which is a Del Mar-based interior design studio. They have projects located throughout Southern California, especially in San Diego, where Michelle works both on legacy architecture projects as well as contemporary homes. She's known for an emphasis on curated art, lighting, as well as integrating new and vintage furniture into all of her projects. Okay, so today, um, I would love, uh, we don't have a set uh, script that we're gonna be reading off of. We really would love it if it was more of a discussion. So please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A or the chat, either way, um, as they're speaking, we'd love to take your questions as they occur to you. You don't need to wait until the end, although we'll certainly have a Q&A at the end um, to discover about this amazing, mo little known architectural person based in San Diego. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, we have some images of the current and past projects. And um, Lisa, I will ask you to kind of first tell us a little bit about who is Lillian J. Rice. Great, well, thanks everybody for coming today. And I have to say, um, I have worked on a few of our houses, but I just wanted to say, you know, this book here, which we'll have at the end, which is Diane Welch wrote, um, it's where I got most of my input about Lillian and her history. Um, she lived short life. She was from 18, uh, 1889 to 1938. And while her um, career was only 16 years, she was during the Depression era, and it was quite astounding that a woman architect, which was rare at the time, um, could be so successful during such a hard time of the Depression. And she was well-educated, professional, and independent um, career woman of the era. And she helped uh, shape an aesthetic regional style for Southern California, um, that remains still valid today. Uh, Rice took the humble peasant architecture of Southern Spain and mixed it with the mission and Pueblo style and details and made it uniquely hers. Uh, she made her work fit with the uh, modern 20th century client that she had. Um, she was beloved by many, but she never got married, she never had kids. The picture in the beginning with her dog, but um, she was appointed one of the first trustees of the Rancho Santa Fe School District and took a uh, personal interest in education of the children in her community as well as people who uh, had an interest in architecture. And um, she actually had the one of her students went on to de uh, design the Del Mar Fairgrounds. Many of Rice's projects were modest residents um, and even her fine estate homes, as you see here in this picture, um, have restrained decorative treatment that tastefully enhanced the overall design rather than to dominate uh, it. So she was very restrained. Um, 
In the 1930s, she was one of, she was not one of, she was the only female San Diego um, member of the American Institute of Architects. And while her peers were from the East Coast, uh, she was a native San Diegan, born in National City. Um, she saw the Hispanic influence of architecture eclipse the Victorian age of the 1880s. And she graduated from UC Berkeley in 1910. Um, she taught at San Diego State and San, uh, San Diego Union High School. Um, in, the 19, in 1921 is when she really made her big break. She was hired as a draftsperson by Rex and Jackson. And that's when things took a dramatic turn because um, there were more lucrative projects in the firm and uh, Richard Requa uh, passed on the master planning for Rancho Santa Fe to Lillian. And at that point, she started to direct a large team of workers developing Rancho Santa Fe. And in 1928, she started her office. This picture here is actually when there was a workers strike and um, all the men had to, they went on strike, and these are all women, the wives of these men, that took on, uh, you know, building Rancho Santa Fe, doing the digging, that's Lillian there, I believe, on the right, um, with her foot up on the pedals, so it's kind of interesting. Um, she then designed, through her firm, the lion's share of homes and a lot of the buildings in downtown uh, Rancho Santa Fe outside of the ranch um, more closely reflected the organic style popularized, popularized by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and in the 1930s is when she really hit her stride and she designed um, San Diego Unified School District and she designed an elementary school and was commissioned by many wealthy clients. Um, one of the most famous was Bing Crosby as he was developing um, the Del Mar racetrack and got very involved. So she worked on an adobe house there that was historic and the stables and remodeling of his estate in Rancho Santa Fe. And then in uh, Douglas Fairbanks, you've heard of Fairbanks Ranch, it was Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford. They bought 800 acres out in Rancho Santa Fe and she is they came to for designs. Fortunately, and it ended all too soon. Um, and at the height of her career in 1938, she died of ovarian cancer at only 39. So throughout her career, she remained true to a heartfelt philosophy that buildings should harmonize with the land. And I'll just read you a little quote that she had in an article from um, Architecture, a community asset that she uh, had written in 1928. I found real joy in Rancho Santa Fe. Every environment there calls for simplicity and beauty and the gorgeous nature, natural landscape of the gently broken topography and the nearby mountains. No one with a sense of fitness, it seems to me, could violate these natural factors by creating anything that lacked simplicity in line, form, and color. So as Michelle and I embarked on this project, um, that was one of the things that the client um, was after. They, these are some of Lillian's uh, renderings here that you see on the screen. And you can see everything's very low slung and very simplistic and blends into the landscape. And our client um, wanted to respect the, the historic home and add something to it, but that would modernize it, of course, but also there was a lot of up and down in the house. There were a lot of different floor levels. When you walked out to the pool, it wasn't indoor, outdoor. There wasn't a cabana. They have these young children. And so when we first met with the client, that's what they wanted to do. This picture you're looking at, um, if you go back one, I'll show yeah. you. But that on the right side where there's a flat roof, that's the original house. And so when we work with these historic homes, we try to do something a little different so you can clearly see where the old and new started. So on the left is the cabana portion. And um, on the next one, you'll see the back side of the house, which um, will show how there's a cabana opposite the pool. And 
those two French doors there are part of the existing house, um, but we obviously updated it and that uh, there'll be another picture later on, but that's a stained glass window in the middle of those doors that we repurposed from the other side of the house. So trying to keep some things um, past. And uh, Michelle too will step in here and tell us some of the things that we tried to do as we went through this. Lisa, sorry, how does this photo uh, relate to the previous one? I think you said, but I didn't. The, the flat portion there kind of in the center, that's the corner of the original house. And it's probably just opposite of where that car is right now. And connected with an outdoor um, pool cabana, which is what you see to the right there. And, and then the roof line to the left is the covered terrace that came off of the family room wing, which we added. So the existing house was comprised of a living space and a bedroom wing. And it had a kitchen area that kind of stepped up and had a lot of ins and outs about it. So they wanted to simplify that and have a more open floor plan living with indoor, outdoor. And so that's what you're seeing here, how it opens up to the outdoor space. What kind of condition was the home in when you and Michelle first came upon it? So the client had worked on the bedroom wing himself a little earlier. And when we first looked at it, it was okay, right, Michelle? <laughs> but um, we got into the walls, we saw there was a lot of damage. I mean, this was in 1924. So um, there were the, the that corner you're looking at there with the light really was almost all had to be rebuilt. That, that all the two by fours and everything just completely rotted out. It was amazing that corner was still standing. So the contractor had his work cut out for him. <laughs> gotcha. Michelle, you want to tell them about the beams? How there were styrofoam beams in there. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So obviously the home has been owned by several owners since the original ones. And it was, um, I guess to put it nicely, a lay person's attempt to try to recreate what would have been authentic for the home. But they were styrofoam beams, much like you would see at apartment buildings, what have you, lightweight, low cost, and they had to go. So uh, reclaimed vintage beams that would have been appropriate for that vintage of the home were procured. And that's what you see in this image right here. And you also see old, see old, uh, old writing in these beams that were added, which would be very much appropriate for the style of the home. And in this picture, you also see this, the stucco arch on the left, that was original. And yeah. this we adjoined to the new home so the arch uh, on that's framed in wood that we mirrored the original arch that kind of opened from the living room into the dining room and became the joinery of the kitchen because before the kitchen was right there and that was a solid wall so he take some of what Lillian had originally had one of the strong features of the living room in expanded upon it by adding another. Did you have any old images of this house that you looked at? Were there any surviving interior shots of after it was recently built? Not really, no. I think the client had a, one of her standing on the front porch, but we couldn't find that in time for this presentation. But yeah, we didn't really add much on the inside. There's There were some clear things that were holdovers that had never been touched. And then that Michelle said there were other unfortunate things, <laughs> yeah. some beams that came into play. Exactly. Yeah. And then these French doors were, uh, what were they originally wall or what was? Um, there were doors there, they were wood French doors. And actually they stepped down onto a stoop and then you would walk down like two steps. So we raised that whole pair, pool terrace. So the French door you see to the left, that goes to the front of the house. The French door you see to the right, that goes out to the pool. And so by lifting the elevation of the pool, we were able to create much more of an indoor, outdoor, open feel mm -hmm. to the house. 
And what you don't see in this image, but you will see in the others, is on the steel French doors to the right, where the wood, the opening is um, blocked in, that's where the stained glass is that you saw in the previous images. So that's actually the dining room and then the stained glass that was repurposed and placed in that opening right there. Great. So how old is this shot? Like a year old? Is um, um, probably a little less, not more like 10 months or so. Okay. Okay, great. So, so Lisa, what were some of the big sweeping changes to the floor plan that you made? So basically the kitchen was demolished and the kitchen at the time would have been more of a, uh, they didn't have open floor plan. A lot of times people either had somebody who cooked for them or cooking was behind the scenes. It was not family affair. Everybody, you know, cook dinner was made and put on the dining room table and everybody sat around the table and talk. Now it wasn't like everybody gathering in the kitchen. So that was really wanting to be more open with their young family. And um, there wasn't a family room. So we added that. And there also um, wasn't a good approach from the backyard. The backyard is really where the garage is. It's a detached garage. So we made we call it friendly entry, the entry from the back versus the front door entry. And then, um, of course, raising the pool and changing the pool and adding a pool cabana. So they have young kids and they're already having fun out there in the pool and they have a TV out there. And that was integrated into the landscape. There was just an enormous tree and we were able to tuck this cabana under it. You'll see later. We'll get to a picture. But and then right here you can see that kind of the same shot we just looked at with the two french doors and the stained glass window that on the back side of the house um and it had a sloped top to it so we had a, a, a artisan come and refurbish it and take the slanted portion off and then we put it here in the dining room so that was that is a question. Are the stain? Someone's asking. Are those original to the home? So these are the original stained glass windows. The stained glass is original to the home. Wow. Yeah, that we love the dining room. Wow. Yeah, that was in the dining room. But and he essentially completely rebuilt it. You know, because over time the glass started slagging. Like Lisa mentioned, the shape was chamfered at the top, and um, although it was in still pretty decent shape. In order for it to last another hundred years, it made sense to go ahead and have um, Pat's glass at a Point Loma restore it for us. And it was a job, you know, it was quite a project, but it, it was fantastic. The colors are incredible. And yeah. The, color, the colors of the stained glass you actually see throughout the home and some of the furnishings and some of the accent colors and, and which you may not see in some of these photos, but there's a blush pink and the stained glass that now is very much on trend, if you will, but it's a color that's been popular a hundred years ago and now that you see in the butler's pantry. So we really took cues and direction from that stained glass and implemented those colors throughout. Oh, because you know that these are the colors that she picked. Yeah. 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 This, was, this window was in a pretty uncelebrated back corner of the house. And so we put it here, which is in the dining room, and you see it through those arches, and it's right on axis with the pool. So you really get to see it from a lot of locales. And in this middle picture here, you can see the wood flooring, which is a white oak, which just, you know, brings together, I think there was three different kinds of wood flooring, right, Michelle? Mm -hmm. yeah. It was old, it was a mix match, but this really brought it all together. Great. That's great. Okay, so Michelle, this is more for you. So how did you, you've got different eras. You've got things that are more striking, very much right now, modern design moments integrated within an environment that really does celebrate a hundred years ago. How did you do that? Um, well, I, you know, the client drove a lot of that. Um, the client is very much passionate about design and different style eras and, and um, modern furnishings. And so we like to imagine that the original owners of the home, although they inhabited a Spanish colonial revival home by Lillian Rice, would have been ones who would have traveled 
and wouldn't have lived so themish, right? So we try to pay homage to the bones and architecture of the home with some of the, the design decisions. But on the other hand, we wanted to both modernize it and make it feel more curated and not so formulaic. So again, thinking of what the original owners may have lived like, they may have traveled at the very least throughout the United States, perhaps abroad, and they would have collected artworks and accessories and furnishings from different countries and different styles. And so we thought that was important to make it not feel so much like a case study home, but to feel like a home that was very much lived in and I think that particular style of the house lends well to doing an eclectic mix. Um, you know, Spanish colonial revival is not so rigid that the furnishings, the light fixtures, the hardware, everything have to line up with that. So we were very lucky to have a client that was supportive of and supportive and knowledgeable of different design classics. You know, in the dining room here, you see car client leather chairs that he had restored. This is Rose Uniac table. And the light fixtures are very current, but you know because they are fabricated out of a live metal, they're going to patina and age over time, which we like. You know the home has aged over time, um, but still very much in shape. And we wanted the light fixtures, hardware, and such to do the same. Yeah. On the left are closet doors in the primary bedroom that actually will lead to a TV closet, if you will. And it was very important that we left those in the home. They're beautiful. You know, we have current clients that are trying to find pieces such as these and reclaim them. And these were already here for us. So um, these, these doors were in the home. Those doors were in the home and they were refinished and refurbished to, you know, bring them to a better condition, but those were part of the home. And the beams, are these new or old beams? Those are reclaimed beams. They're new to the home, but yeah. they're reclaimed and appropriate for the vintage. Because so, like Lisa yeah. mentioned before, there were styrofoam beams throughout, which were... Yeah, that took the place of the ugly styrofoam ones. Yeah. They looked like they were always there. Exactly. And that was important too. Like the actual bones of the home, it was important, I think, and Lisa, you might agree, like to feel that they were part of the home. But I think it's such a really nice mix of old elements, new elements, refurbished elements, all that really work well and play together to where we're at now. And these um, windows on the right here, the arches. So they're actually new, but they were done in the style with the rondelles or the bottle glass. And also by the same person, Pat, who we had to restore the vintage stained glass, um, put this together. So this is on the street side of the cabana. So we wanted to have the light, but didn't want to necessarily have, you know, people looking in. And, and to Lillian's, you know, uh, use of simple details, right? So just very simple, don't need a lot of molding and fuss about this. Um, and just the slight recess between them that gives, you know, marries the two together. And in this case was used for a sconce, but everything she did was very restrained. And in the center picture, that cove detail on the ceiling, that was something new that wasn't there. But again, that would have been a very, um, a popular design element and she had used a cove detail in other projects but you know for whatever reason in this project it didn't have it and so when this dining room got larger we needed to adjoin the new ceiling so we added that cove mm -hmm. very nice. simple it's not a big fussy crown molding it's not a lot going on but it's so subtle details that she would have incorporated and we tried to do the same. It's very understated. Yeah. Elegance. So Lisa and Michelle, for both of you, what is something that you knew, like, we want to avoid this? What did you, did you have something in mind that like, oh, don't do this. This will really not honor the Lillian J. Rice legacy. Well, I can tell you one thing that was entertained early on was adding a second story. Um, and at the time when we were looking at the massing of the house, because you saw how it was really just a flat parapet roof, it didn't have a clay tile roof. And when we're um, looking at the massing, it just didn't sit right in the topography, which she was very 
for. And it was a low slung, simple house before. And we just didn't feel the need to tower over. And the client agreed. Um, it was going to be an extra bedroom and uh, office up there. And they decided that we'll forego that extra space to keep, you know, lines of the house being low slung. So that was one thing from an architectural standpoint. That's great. Love it. Um, here's a question. Does, does the house have any historical designation? And if so, did that impact the renovations and the addition? You know, it was not formally designated. Um, the Through the years, various things had been done to it and we were not able to get that. Um, but nonetheless, it was important to the homeowner to still abide by a historic renovation, but no, it's not registered. And that's what I see with a lot of her, her projects. They're either changed so much that they don't maybe keep enough of their historic value, or unfortunately, you know, things have just been lost to demolition, but. That's what, that was my next question, actually. Is there, are any of her buildings protected or have the designation? Oh, yeah, there are. I can't list them all. There are several in downtown Rancho Santa Fe that are. I mean, the, the Rancho Santa Fe um, Historical Society is in one of her buildings. Um, there's a handful of them there. There's a couple in La Jolla that I know of that are registered. So, yes, she has several. That's great. That's great. Okay. Um, so, all right. So you had a tiny little, a small enclosed kitchen. And is the current kitchen in the same place? Uh, in general terms, it's in the same place. It expanded, it moved over a little bit, um, but was definitely reimagined. Oh. <laughs> and yeah. I am fascinated by this kitchen. It's so beautiful. And I feel like it's not the expected thing that, the expected result that you would have in a house like this I just it's so restrained it's all it's so beautiful and restrained so Michelle walk us through this amazing kitchen um the client um was very enamored with plain English kitchens and it was a really good fit for the style of the home and the way these kitchens were fabricated and I think you know, what you said, it's so understated, which you see throughout the home is that really the beauty and interest lies in the materials and the little details. It's not so obvious, I guess, at first glance, but it's the little nuances that you see as you move through the space, in particular the kitchen, just the, the joinery, the hardware, um, the different materials, the colors, again, which may feel very trendy right now, like a blush pink. However, when you were looking at Spanish colonial revival homes, or again, maybe homes that the original client may have traveled, you would see some of those colors. You would see the blush pinks, you would see the ox blood, ox blood red, the blacks and so forth. And the client was all about implementing those and avoiding the all white kitchen or um, a kitchen that wouldn't feel appropriate in the architectural style of the home. And then again, we have the addition of the reclaimed beams, the, the uh, skylight that has been adorned with the reeded glass. And hanging a pendant from the skylight. And that was a lot of coordination on oh, Lisa's beautiful. part. Yeah, the fabrication of that and just to every detail with the light fixture spec, the glass fabricator, the metal fabricator, Island Architects, you know, it's, it seems so simple in the photograph, but it's, it's quite a bit of legwork that goes behind that. And it's nice too with the, um, the marble wall there and to have it a flush set and, and just to have a plaster hood. You can't quite tell in some of these, but we did have um, a King's Mill finish on the walls, which is a, is a plastering. So it's, it's not just a painted drywall finish. And so it gives that old plastered look to it, which it's hard to pick up in, in photos, but in person, it's just a beautiful living finish that has just a subtle sheen to it because it's hand troweled on. Um, so there's highs and lows to it and it's very natural. Mm -hmm. it adds a lot of new dimension. And again, it goes back to the understated elegance, letting the marble speak, the hood is just a simple shape. Um, 
But yeah, the dimension of the plaster is really beautiful, especially in the raking light. And you know, the kitchen being right off these steel French doors again, when the light comes through, you can see the hand marks where um, the troweling have been done. That's beautiful. Is this um is this inset um for display? Is it like a, a little bar? Yeah, that it's not a bar, it's just a shelf area. You know, some of this project just finished. So some of these projects are before they're it's all staged. Right. Um, so that's it's um underneath there is where there's because right out of the shot there's a fireplace. I don't I think we might as we go through other pictures. Yeah have more but there's a fireplace there so under is wood storage on that bottom and then display and there's a beautiful bar which i also think we have a picture of just behind where whoever's taking this picture yeah gotcha, gotcha. all right this is a Lisa, tree. This is our amazing tree that is probably a planted when the home was built or before right yeah yeah and you know in learning about her and i learned about her um she was friends with kate sessions kate sessions was a landscape architect who basically brought in a lot of the planting for balboa park um a lot of her nursery was in la jolla and this tree it's a big um uh, it's just an amazing beautiful tree and it probably was there when the house was built. Um, it had these big, long and outstretched limbs. And you can see the one that's cut right yeah. in the foreground there. And that's because um, that would have been going right through the cabana. So we really placed this cabana so that it could nestle under the tree and try to do the least damage to the tree. But we wanted to use the cabana not only for privacy to the pool, but also to create a bit of a sound um, barrier from the, the road below. And um, if you know about the ranch, fire is a big issue and trees need to be 15 feet away from structures. So the fact that, you know, that that tree limb is only about five inches from that um, railing right there, and it's about two feet from the roof. The fact that we were able to get that passed was quite a, <laughs> a feat. So everybody, including the client, was happy that we could save this tree because that tree was not going to go anywhere. It was important to everybody. So beautiful. Great. Okay. And which room is this now? This is the same. This is the cabana. Yeah, so the, the image on the right is just pulled further back where you see that beautiful tree. That's the client's vintage wine tasting table and some new chairs. And of course, the more contemporary light fixture above. On the left-hand side um, is the game room that's behind that fireplace in the kitchen. So again, we have that juxtaposition of the vintage reclaimed beams and a more contemporary light fixture. And again, contemporary because it's a modern maker, but being that it's made out of a live metal, it's gonna patina and age over time and keeping with the house. That is so beautiful. Where, the, on the left-hand um, image, where did you get that lighting piece or who designed uh, it? That light fixture is from Apparatus. Oh yeah. And on the right-hand side, that light fixture is from a company named Bocce. That was a very fun process the contractor's um, son mocked those up. So Juliet, who's sitting over here hiding over here in the corner, actually made uh, paper shades so that way we could get exactly the height and the staggering that we wanted. And he was on a burrow, um, what do you call it? Sawhorse. Uh, sawhorse on top of a stack of drywall taping these up for us so we could get them just right so that when the electrician showed up we wouldn't have to do it again which we did again and um <laughs> but there's like there's like 15 of them and we were very particular about the heights and the locations and what you don't see in that image is this this is not a typical light fixture where the pendants hang from one canopy this is a 15 light fixtures where the cable actually goes inside the drywall. So you don't oh, see the mount or the beam. Yeah, and the yeah, beam. Some, some are on the beam. The beam some are, well, yeah. Well, wow, um, and so what is this material here? 
Um, they're ceramic, or excuse me, the ones on the right are porcelain. The ones on the left are porcelain and ceramic and live brass. Beautiful. Wow. Okay. All right. So the powder room, or one of the powder rooms. So what what are we looking at here? So that's the old powder room. It's it's one of the things that the client kept. It's teeny tiny. <laughs> <laughs> this is the original tile and the original painting from the original house. Um, if you're sitting in the toilet, your knees will be against that cabinet. <laughs> yeah, it's really small. You can't even really take a good picture because it is so small. And, you know, we luckily the, it wasn't too much of a, a arm twisting to have the client want to save this because it's right in the hall. And it's just nice to have something that's completely untouched. That's of, sweet. Um, there was one thing we did lose, which Michelle and I didn't know about. Um, there was this beautiful little hand painted on the outside door of this in the hall, um, a little vine with little flowers and, and leaves. And um, it was just beautiful. And we had planned for this new pla plaster to stop and, and basically frame this and keep it there. And, I came in and it was gone. It was plastered up. Oh. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> so we lost a little part of it, but we kept this part of it. Yeah. So, and do, do you, this is hand painted cabinetry that matches the tile in a way? Is that what's happening? Yeah. 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 All hand painted tiles and cabinetry. Really nice. And, ama and amazingly, it lasted that long, you know? Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. 100 years. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now here's an example of design is in the details. What what are we looking at here, Michelle? This is a switch plate from Forbes and Lomax. That's in a um, unlacquered brass. So one of the things that we really didn't um, discuss with the client till near the end was the detail of the switch plates and outlet covers. And you know, we have this beautiful plaster on the walls and as plastic plates were going in, it really just was so um, incongruous with the plaster walls. It, like we, the, this can't happen. So Juliet over here to my left, who's hiding. Um, we've always tried to get these in a project where it made sense. And this project made a hundred percent sense to use these and we broached it with the client and he was like absolutely there was no arm wrestling that had to happen uh, it made sense for him to um spend the money on this because it is so important and again the white plastic plates as lovely as they are in certain settings just did not work here and after seeing these go in and the coordination that it took with the architect. I mean, it could have been, it couldn't have been any other material. So, if you, so for those of you who don't know, the old type of lights would have this, it's like a little toggle push button. Yeah. And push it. And that's what light switches were. They were not a flip. No. Um, and so when you go to a real old house, you might still see these, but because of electrical codes, they've usually come out. Right. So this company, has made these which are really great for historic renovations they are very expensive however and you have had clients i've been trying to talk into doing because they're so beautiful and yeah. uh, we finally got the, the uh, this client to do it because he really did a, appreciate the, the details. yeah do you, yeah. do you push it to turn on and off and can you yeah. twist to dim dim yeah okay and throughout the home, there's different configurations of this, obviously, with, you know, four gang panels, five gang panels of different light switch and dimmers. This is one of the more simple options. I think this one was in the, the primary bedroom mm -hmm. where it just has to push and dim. But again, it's that live metal finish that's going to patina and be more beautiful over time. And um, yeah, you know, it's funny because we even, you know, trying to be conscious of this budget and not just be the typical designer trying to spend more money and adding on more things even try to say hey but maybe we just do it in the public areas but he was he was so on board he's like we're just we're just going to do it right and we're going to do it everywhere and um love it it was the right decision love it gorgeous 
Okay, all right. So Lillian J. Rice lives, her work lives on. Um, Lisa, you wanna walk us through some of the places where people can interact with and see some of her work, even though a lot of her homes are hard to see from the street, there are some great examples. Yeah. Yeah, in Rancho Santa Fe, um, things are all back off the street, so it's hard to see many of them. But this list is all of things that are downtown, and some of them are in more original condition than others, but um, they're all available to see just from the street. And there's even more, more of the buildings that are downtown Rancho Santa Fe on the main strip there are hers, but this is just a partial listing of them. And obviously, for those of you really interested, this um, book here that's pictured um, is full of information on Lillian, um, as is the Historical Society, um, which is in the place of the uh, building that she built. Um, what's, cut, what's interesting on this book uh, here, Rancho Santa Fe being developed in the 20s was really uh, one of the first communities that took the car into consideration. And this is a gas pump, what you're seeing on that. I mean, the gas pump was a novel idea and what are you gonna do with it? So that's the gas station and that's a gas pump, which kind of is done up like a wishing well. Mm -hmm. Imagine, you know, the importance of your very first gas pump in the whole <laughs> region. Just had one. Um, Back then, it was still not everybody had a car. So, um, right. yeah, and that's so that's a book for anybody who's really interested in learning more about her. And not much about her either, because um, as Diane Welch found out, you know, when she started doing her research, I mean, she was very prolific in Rancho Santa Fe and kind of reached into La Jolla and areas in San Diego, but. Um, there is just very little known about her and she her career was fairly short lived 16 years and so um, there's not much but there's a lot that she did so she accomplished a lot in those 16 years yeah, yeah. you know Lisa I like you know we had chatted about this earlier and I really liked your take on it when because she did work for another architect and she was young and new in her field. And, you know, you had mentioned, it was kind of like, we're gonna hand this project off to yeah. the girl in the office. And it turned out to be really something amazing. You know, like you said, this beautiful enclave in Southern California that was just right. a throwaway project. Right, because he had so many more lucrative projects going on. He's like, oh, this little development of Rancho Santa Fe and a master plan for it. It's like, uh, you know, I've got my hands full with the more important things. And right. here, it's like, sure, I'll take it. I'll do the, and then look what she did with it. Yeah, I like the master plan like and yeah. so many, so many of the commercial buildings as well as the houses and. You know, when she was hired as a drafts person by Requa, it was 21. And, you know, by 28 or 26, I think she was, she had her own office. Yeah. So pretty speedy trajectory, especially for right. a woman right. in those in days. Time. Yeah. yeah. So, well, maybe um, it's maybe more um, recognition is coming for her. Um, there's going to be an uh, unveiling of a statue. Is that right? Yeah. What's going down to in the Down in the center, right, in Rancho Santa Fe. Unveiling of a, a statue, commemorative statue of Lillian. But they actually believe we're going to do much sooner, but because of COVID and stuff, it got prolonged, correct? That's right. I think it was scheduled for last year, wasn't it, Lisa? Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. So um, the new date is going to be in October next month for people who are interested. And um, yeah, if there are any further questions, you can pop them in the chat. And otherwise, um, we very much thank you for coming today and um, celebrating one of San Diego's um, most prolific and um, lesser known architects who deserve a bigger place in history for sure. There's the puppy dogs. They're so cute. And that's probably the most exquisite 
dog bed that's ever to exist. Again, the client, we love these clients that are so on board with uh, vintage and antiques and just beautiful one-of-a-kind finds. This is a Swedish antique that was not inexpensive and his bulldogs will use that as a dog bed in the kitchen. Nice life. Yeah. So, all right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.